Hello, good evening. This is Paul Lennon again. This is tape 10 in the series of uh, Our Father Maciel, who art in bed, a naive and uh, sentimental Dubliner in the Legion of Christ. We're continuing chapter 10, retreating from the world. And at this part of our story, we are in Rome, studying now for the priesthood, doing philosophy and theology. I will continue, I want to link up with my previous tape. I was talking about the, the lack perhaps of a spiritual sensitivity, of, um, of a caring, of a pastoral outreach, and um, the lack of listening. We had ended up with the, uh, the quote from uh, the dysfunctional family and the characteristics of a don't talk, don't feel, and don't trust. Why didn't my superiors and spiritual directors adapt a more exploratory approach to discernment and spiritual guidance? Because they did not know any better. They themselves had been trained that way. They had never discovered the possibility or learned the art of truly listening. The voice of God, the promptings of the Spirit, had always come from the outside. As a result, I disregarded, repressed my own thoughts, opinions, and questions, my feelings, my pain, my searching, my questing. I repressed myself. Where was my soul? my own soul, my personal, individual, and unique soul in all of this? Paragraph. Coming up for air. Fortunately, during my Rome sojourn, uh, because I needed to keep in touch with the English language, I was able to do some personal reading beyond the regular Legion fair. Partly because of my obsessive thoughts, I became an avid reader of C.S. Lewis, and his Christian apologetics, as well as other spiritual authors. So I used the excuse of having to keep up with my English language, which I was in danger of losing, and to be able to read a little bit beyond what was the regular Legion fair. These beyond rote memorization of New Testament passages, unimaginative letters of Maestro Padre, and other mind-numbing assigned readings would become a lifeline for me. So we already began my bibliotherapy, which I strongly believe in. I explicitly got permission to read each book, if not from the rector, at least from the prefect of studies. He was my go-to man. I owe him a lot. However, I must be thankful for the kindness of the prefect who supplied books of literature for me to, re to review in both English and Spanish. Whereas Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, the Russian classics, were considered safe reading, we were never allowed to read Sartre or other existentialist or dangerous liberal non-conventional writers. I creatively managed to carve out some intellectual freedom for myself by writing my philosophy paper on Gabriel Marcel, a Christian existentialist. In my free time, I sank my teeth into Graham Greene, Catholic author, who describes the struggle of good and evil in every soul and God's mysterious action beneath appearances. What better than to read his The Power and the Glory to gain insight into Mexico's religious persecution? Did the end of the affair help my fate? And what was the special fascination with Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms? I can only surmise in retrospect that human drama greatly attracted me, men and women of flesh and blood with feelings and passions that made life untidy. The end of the affair was a kind of solution to the celibacy problem. A man could renounce a woman for love of her. She could renounce him for love of God. This was Graham Greene. I, conject, I conjectured that troubled Hemingway revealed something about himself 
in the protagonist of A Farewell to Arms. Losing the love of his life in a meaningless way could have turned him against the God he hath believed in. I knew what it was like to struggle with the absent God who seems to abandon us to our fate. Maybe there was a glimpse of hope in the unconventional of God of Green, who is so unpredictable and writes straight on crooked lines. Another fresh of breath air came via my occasional visits. I was still the community nurse to the doctor's office in Lungo Tevere, Roma. Dr. Cesare Valenti, a World War II paramedic, was our pro bono physician and one of my only human contacts with the outside world. He liked me, Fra Paolo, he used to call me, Brother Paul, and treated me as a fellow healer. He was a very down-to-earth person and often saw through the somatic nature of some of my sanctimonious brother's illnesses, gruffly remarking in his Romanaccio uh, regarding one brother who was very uh, sensitive or a little bit maybe hypochondriac, and he made him, you know, he examined him and so forth and did some exercises with him, and then he growled to me aside, uh, quello non ha niente. There's nothing wrong with that guy. <laughs> There's nothing wrong. Despite his apparent indifference to Catholicity, he's one of those many Roman and Italian atheists. Um, he cared for me and for my vocation. One day I was reading Curzio Malaparte's Caput, a lurid description of war or atrocities, and he remarked, that's not the kind of book a seminarian should be reading. You should be reading Manzoni's I Promessi Sposi, A Couple in Love. The Legion also, excuse me, depended on the kindness of generous strangers to take care of the seminary's dental needs. We received no dental attention in Salamanca except emergency extractions. I have no idea how the earlier generation fared in Rome. In the mid-60s, a new order of nuns came to our assistance. Le pie discepole del divino maestro. That versatile and prolific <laughs> Italian priest, Don Alberione, founded them to attend to the health needs of priests and religious. Being a new foundation, Le Suore, the sisters, were very young, and some were actually very pretty. I was fortunate to be personally attended by one of them, Sor Angelica, of the Heavenly Touch, and I am sure the other seminarians enjoy their visits to the well-equipped clinic. I was grateful to get my dental needs served, and I could become... And I, I, I could because I hadn't seen I hadn't seen a dentist in 15 years. And in the midst of all this, my parents decided to visit me in Rome. It was September 1966, and I was beginning my first year of theological studies. I had been five years since they they said goodbye to me in Dublin Airport, together with John Devlin and and Raymond Comiskey's parents. They stayed at Hotel Fiume. Also, oh, three couples came. We were allowed to visit the churches and other places of interest with them. It was a great treat. They were so proud of me, although I felt, again, silly, self-conscious, and ungainly wearing the clerical capello on my head and took it off whenever I could. <laughs> all in all, this was a joyous occasion, though I felt estranged from my parents after such a long time of not seeing them. And they felt awkward towards me because now I was a legionary religious and a future priest, and in a sense, no longer belonged to them. Excuse me. In December of that same year, tragedy stuck, struck for me. So, October, November, three months later, one evening, Father Duenas, the rector of the seminary in Rome, 
called me to his office and told me my dad was very ill and that I would be leaving for Dublin as soon as possible. By the time I got on the plane, I knew he had died. I was on my way to the funeral. I was devastated because three months prior they had, he had been healthy and smiling and I was enjoying his warmth and seeing myself reflected in his proud and kindly eyes. Now he was gone. I was the future priest and I did not have any answers. I could neither console nor be consoled. I tweaked the rules and stayed on longer than my superiors would have liked in order to be with my grieving mother and sisters, two of whom were still very young. Paragraph. Roman Isolation, page 124. For seven years I was whisked through the streets of Rome in the beige Mercedes Benz coach, screening my chaste eyes from provocative billboards, and they've got them, of six-cylinder Alfa Romeos and twin-cylinders Gina Lolo Rigidas. Our driver, Father Tarsicio Samaniego, would drop me and other 50 legionaries off on the steps of the Gregorian University, Piazza della Pilota. Forever self-conscious, I was further embarrassed not to be allowed to chat with the other seminarians at the Greg. Despite this human isolation and control at the university, with its theological effervescence, we were exposed to more ideas than at home. But because of the Legion's conservative bent, which I embraced at the time, we were never allowed to read progressive theologians of the day, such as Karl Rahner, uh, the young Joseph Ratzinger, uh, pardon, uh, such as Karl Rahner or Skillebex or the Dominican Eve Congar, who was one of the principal theologians of Vatican II. Uh, Walter Casper and even the young Joseph Ratzinger, they were accepted with reservations. So I think I was saying that I wasn't allowed to read Rahner and Skillebex, those um, Dutch theologians who wrote the Dutch Catechism too far out for the legionaries, but I was allowed to read the other guys. But because of the legion's conservative bent, which I embraced at the time, okay, I was so gung-ho Catholic, I avidly read and agreed with Cordula, or Cordula from Balthasar's critique of Karl Rahner's overly optimistic thesis. Was in theology there in Germany. Uh, he, according to Rahner, all men of goodwill are anonymous Christians. That was the phrase of the year, perhaps. The anonymous Christians, whether they knew it or not, and they could be saved whether they knew it or not. And there was always soccer to aid my perseverance. When we moved to Rome, and I was a philosophy student, we played against theology students on special occasions. Dirty play was kept to a minimum, but there was always the odd player who got stuck in. I won't say who. I've been accused of occasionally putting the boot in on some of the heavier opponents. But such allegations are, as Father Maciel so often says regarding allegations of sexual misconduct, nothing more than scurrilous rumors. Intramurals, I played as a philosophy student against theology students, could get heated. Once I got rough with the impassive Raul de Anda. He was a tough defender, so I gave him some of his own medicine, ruffling his usually imperturbable features. Afterwards, of course, I felt guilty. I was sorry about it and, and asked my community superior for permission to apologize to a theology student. I was philosophy, he was in theology. We, there was a barrier there, so I had to ask special permission to approach the theology student in his room. When uh, he opened the door, I, I stated my apology briefly, naturally in Spanish. Eh, perdone, padre, eh, me parece que jugué muy duramente contra usted hoy. He looked at me without blinking and without any show of emotion, answered, I don't remember, no me acuerdo, as he closed the door in my face. 
He was, uh, he was always immaculately groomed and dressed in a clean black cassock. He was one of Father Maciel's personal secretaries going in and out of the founders' quarters on the second floor at the Aurelia 677. And he left before ordination and got a PhD in experimental psychology. With that impressive background and, and ever faithful to Nuestro Padre Maciel, he was appointed clinical director of Alpha Omega Family Center in Lomas, Mexico City, in the 70s. At the same time, I would be opening the School of Faith not far away, all in beautiful and fashionable Lomas de Chapultepec. A slap and a pat from the founder. A slap and a pat on the back from the founder. During the Second Vatican Council sessions, Father Maciel was busy coming and going between our college and the Vatican. One day as he came in through the main entrance, a large group of seminarians gathered around him to hear his news. There in the foyer outside the chapel, he began to go on about certain theologians who were destroying the Catholic Church. He reeled off a list of dangerous theologians, including Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin, then a real bone of contention among conservatives because of his melange of spirituality, science, and theology. He's still perhaps a, a kind of a controversial figure, theologically speaking. Suddenly I heard myself asking Mr. Question. Um, I know I'm saying I, I also am a big question. I, I put my foot in it and uh, I ask questions when I'm not supposed to. I am a very can be a very uncomfortable person. I rock the boat. But I have a good American friend who was also like me, and uh, he shared this little anecdote, anecdote with me that uh, when he was in the Legion too, and he was in training, and they had the question sessions, you know, he would always ask uncomfortable questions uh, to Father Maciel, pose these to Father Maciel, and Maciel uh, didn't know what to do, really, because he, he was a little bit intrusive. And, and I think Maciel asked somebody, who's this guy? ¿Quién es el preguntón? <laughs> and, so, and so my American friend always calls himself el preguntón. Now, it's a kind of like when you put the own at the, end of, uh, at the end of a word, the end of an adjective, it's always a little bit, uh, it's kind of like annoying, a little bit uh, downputting. You know, who's this guy with the big mouth that's always asking questions? Anyway, this is my preguntón moment. Suddenly I heard myself asking, and Nuestro Padre, what is wrong with Teilhard de Chardin? I had never read him, but was wondering why Father Maciel would condemn him without knowing much about him either. Or while the jury was still out, Maciel's reaction was a swift and harsh public scolding. Well, Brother Paul, if you want to read Teilhard de Chardin, you can go somewhere else. The door is wide open. Out you go. We cannot allow our students to foster such ideas in the Legion. I wanted the ground to swallow me. What had possessed this quiet, timid religion, religious to ask such a question? Needless to say, I was so ashamed, scared, and helpless, I did not follow his suggestion. Truth was, for several years, I had never been outside the seminary gate or had to fend for any of my basic needs. That is one advantage of being a religious all your practical needs are taken care of. And I would not know what to do or where to go, even if the doors were wide open and a thousand dollars were placed in my palm. This is, uh, I think, uh, Janja, Lo Janja Lalik uh, writes about this. She might, the idea that comes to my, I, in my mind is bounded choice excuse me, bonded choice. You're bonded. You're internally bonded. Outsiders don't know this. You're under the spell. 
this, you're under the enchantment, the bewitchment of the cult. And uh, even though they open the doors, the, the little bird is not going to fly out the door. He's being domesticated. He's being pruned. His will has been pruned, so he, he doesn't have the power to make decisions. Freedom for self-enhancement. Was this the beginning of my intellectual rebellion and of my clandestine readings of Teilhard de Chardin? Who knows? But I was really not all that interested in Teilhard when I asked the question, nor was I fired up to read his writings later on. Many years later, I would peruse la, Le Milieu de Vin. As it turns out, his thinking was too elevated or too speculative or for me. I could not grasp his science and his spirituality did not grab me either. In reality, at the time, I preferred other writers from the French school of spirituality and literature, favored by then Pope Giovanni Battista Montini, Pope Paul VI. I remember reading Bernano in vogue among us legionaries. French lay intellectual, also Jean Guiton, and the convert André Forsard which was really a help for my lack of faith and my tremendous crisis. For Saad, who was a reporter, uh, one day converted to belief, walking into a church or something and being struck by just focusing on the candles that were on the altar and that hit him like a, like a, like a bolt of lightning. Uh, je existe, Dieu, pardon. Dieu existe, je l'encontre. God exists, I met him. Though stung by the put-down, I blame myself for my foolhardiness. I still believed and revered the founder, and Mr. Padre continued to be my spiritual director through the mail, as he had been since the beginning and would be almost to the end. Nor did the occasional clash totally exclude me from some downtime with Martial. Nearing ordination as a padre or theology student, I was occasionally invited to Mr. Padre's table chats. He always took his meals in the guest dining room, a rectangular space on the main floor between the reception area and the dining room, the official dining room, community refectory. In this more private setting, he could receive better treatment from his waiters. His special food could be more easily served, and he could let his hair, scarce as it was, down with a select audience. More refined and discreet legionaries were chosen to wait on the founder, and this be privy to his repartee. Uh, Father John O'Reilly was one of those privileged waiters, I remember. Guests were allowed into this inner circle to entertain Mr. Padre. The spirit of these chats around the breakfast, lunch, or dinner was to, quote, help Mr. Padre relax and give his mind a rest from his heavy workload. Levity was the light motif and jocular the mood. The chosen guests were good at telling jokes, making fun of simple minded members, or being a good victim. I was never a good cocktail conversationalist, and there was also the danger that I might ask one of my awkward questions. Nevertheless, I did feel privileged to be part of the Petit Comité, close to our reader. On several occasions, however, I witnessed Mr. Padre Maciel gloating over how he had outsmarted some unfortunate Legion member or even a priest, or a bishop, or a monsignor at the Roman Curia, whom he considered an enemy of the legion. His attitude was kind of screw him. He got what he deserved amid lo loud guffaws. The founder would chuckle and wink an eye, 
and the privileged few nodded approval. Embracing celibacy, next paragraph. You might suspect that vacation time in sunny Italy posed a challenge to our celibacy. Every summer we went to Monticchio sui due golfi, a tiny town on the olive growing peninsula dividing the Gulf of Naples and the Gulf of Salerno. Pastor Don Micho, 80 year old mother and his very plain sister, the only woman, women I could meet, in reality posed no threat. You see, Though we were in Napoli of Sofia Loren movies, we were staying at an old tumble-down monastery in a remote location. Ancient sisters with one foot in the grave inhabited a separate part of the building. The beaches we frequented were difficult to access and therefore very secluded. We scouted them out and made sure they were never frequented by outsiders, extraños. We made them ours. Former apostolic schoolboys, now chronologically young adults, gave them innocent and adventurous names such as the ravine, the ghost, or the platform. Despite our stunning good looks, I doubt we were ever a source of serious temptation to local or visiting signorine, who occasionally sailed into these secluded coves in their launches. The only local person I remember meeting on our hikes was an old Neapolitan owner of olive groves, Don Crescenzo, and he, did, he loved to meet the seminarians, and I'm sure he was a ray of sunshine in the lives of many of us. He would talk to us in the lazy dialect made famous by Dean Martin and take, make, made us listen to his rendition. Torno surrente, fami campa. Has to be in dialect, right? Bribing us with some of his homemade wine. <laughs> the greenish white liquid, it was a white wine, supposedly. The greenish white liquid was tart, and the layer of olive oil on the top did not help. Belting out the chorus with Don Crescenzo was probably the, coast, the closest I got to emotional release during that stave of my Legion training. So, hey, this is not all, what's it called? Do, do, doom and gloom. <laughs> we went on hikes, always in designated groups of three or four, according to Legion custom. Being competitive, I remember trying to beat others to faraway destinations. And I remember brother uh, Jose Luis Buenrostro, maybe that's his name, Brother Buenrostro, an Italian guy. I say a horse of a man was one of my greatest rivals. I believe I made it to the top of Monte Faito, almost falling off the cliff in the process because at the end it was pretty steep. We, we had no uh, equipment or anything, you know, bare hands kind of thing, mountain goats. But I must admit that he beat me to the Amalfi town on foot because that was also on reach which was a four-hour four trek. Once there with his companions, he would not hoof it into, into the nearest hotel or trattoria for lunch, but rather he would find a quiet nook to eat his sandwich and drink his water. At this stage, late 80s, the Legion was making a bold new fashion statement. Instead of the old white shop coat, now we, were, we wore long khaki pants and a white t-shirt under a light khaki jacket called chamarra in Mexican Spanish. Nuestro Padre Maciel, always the good-natured leg-pulling and jovial leader, cracked a joke about an Irish brother who got the name wrong. So when he said to Nuestro Padre, I want to wear one of those new chamarras, he actually said, I want to wear, in Spanish, I want to wear one of those new chamacas which really meant in Mexican slang, I want to wear one of those new dames. Anyway, all wearing the same uniform wherever we went, we stood out as seminarians or simply as a weird bunch of young men belonging to some kind of institution. During the summer before my fourth year of theological studies, I found my superiors were promoting me to the diaconate. This was major. The diaconate more precisely, the transition of diaconate in the Roman Catholic tradition 
brought with it the solemn vow of celibacy. Nuestro Padre would spend some time with us in Monticchio, where we could talk with him individually before taking that big step. And that's enough for tape 10 now. We will, next time we finish off the part about taking the next step, uh, ordination to transitional deaconate and a priestly ordination in Rome. A prayer for all my Irish friends, all my British friends, Scottish and Welsh and English, who are going through some bad moments, all my American friends who are going to terrible moments, my good Italians, my good Spanish friends, and all those who I know in any remote way, and all those poor people who are suffering and losing loved ones as we speak. And why am I talking about these things during this terrible epidemic? Well, because I'm telling my story, which may distract you or may take your mind off the heavy duty stuff that we're going through. And also a way of, uh, it's a source of information for you. Um, you may enjoy it because I enjoy it to some degree. Uh, as you say, my, as you can see, my, my sense of humor, uh, hopefully not only that, the sense of understanding, my love for other people and, uh, my way of, of uh, you know, looking at the sunny side of things sometimes, as well as the doom and gloom, but, but, but looking for the bright side and, uh, and for the, you know, um, the silver lining, perhaps, uh, at these moments of life. And maybe that's what we have to do now, uh, focus on some of the good, beautiful things we still have, the beautiful people, beautiful, generous, heroic people who are giving their lives at this very moment. And uh, for us Christians, um, that's, that's Christ-like. So, they're going straight to heaven because uh, they're doing what Jesus did. Uh, exactly. Giving their lives for their friends as we enter, also entering now Holy Week. The, the man from Nazareth is entering into his. They use the pa word passion, which is, again, my preaching, a, a kind of a useless word. You know, the passion of our Lord. It, it's the suffering of our Lord. It comes from the Latin, of course, pati, to suffer. But then we got all this passion and passione. <sighs> Forgive me. That's where I get impatient. The week of the suffering of our Lord. He is the Lamb of God. You know, the, what is it called? The surf, suffering servant of uh, Yahweh. Take care. We're accompanying you. Ciao, cari amici. Ciao.